thanks everyone for joining us today. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, as Rika mentioned, well, we're going to go through slides for about 45 minutes. This is going to be a pretty solid 45 minutes because I've got a lot of really fun information to share. And then at the end, we'll go through all of your questions. So please, as questions come up, please pop them into the chat. What we're going to learn today is who many of our common good bugs are that we're going to see in our gardens, how they are helping us, and how to keep them around. It is going to be really fun. So as an integrated pest management or IPM educator, I always like to start off by sharing that yes, IPM is a decision-making process that uses science-based strategies to solve pest problems. We, it allows us to look at the system as a whole, either the house or garden, in this case, the garden, and it helps us identify what the problem is. And then from there, we decide if it's a problem we can live with. A lot of times the problems are very short lived or very minimal, so we can kind of just monitor and see how it goes. If we do need to take action, then we use a combination of strategies that include cultural controls, increasing the health of the garden by adding compost and mulch and working with organic fertilizers, mechanical controls, these are the tools we use to manage pest problems biological controls, using living organisms to manage pest problems. This is our focus today because beneficial insects are a huge part of biological controls. And then of course, chemical controls fall into IPM. However, it's always going to, these are the pesticides, we're always going to use them as a last resort. We're always going to use eco-friendly products. And we might also want to consider if it is a plant that has always struggled or never performed to the way that we've preferred, give yourself permission to get rid of that plant. Sometimes it's just better to get rid of it and plant replace it with something that would thrive much better. So IPM for inviting our good bugs. Identification is the key. We want to set our gardens up for success. We want to grow biodiversity. And then we want to reduce and eliminate pesticide usage. So I have a little game for all of us. Uh, let's just test. I'd like to see if everyone can find the raised hand function on their screen. It's going to be under reactions. If you find raised hand function, I want you to press on it. I want to see some raised hands. Excellent. Let's see more raised hands. Beautiful, raised hands, raised hands. Okay, all right, beautiful. If anybody's having a problem finding the raised hand function, then we are going to uh, put it in the chat and I know Tracy will assist with that, but okay, awesome. So is everyone ready to uh, play a little game? I've set up, uh, a little test for all of us to test our knowledge. Let's get started. Okay. So we can lower our hands. And boom. We see this critter in the garden. Are we going to squish it or not squish? If we squish it, let's raise our hands. Raise our hands if we're going to squish it. I, it's pretty big. It looks really weird. I might be inclined to squish this bug. How many of us would squish it? Raise your hands if you want to squish it. All right. We've got a few hands. Excellent. All right. We have this creature in the garden. Very scary looking. All these little spines and piercing mouth parts. Are we going to squish this bug? Are we going to squish it? Raise your hand if we're going to squish this bug. It's pretty scary looking. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. It's really frightening. I would be freaked out if I saw this, this bug in my garden. All right. All right. Now we see this weird, slimy little thing. Are we going to squish this bug? Or are we going to not squish it? If we're going to squish it, let's raise our hand. Squish it if we're going to, uh, if we see him. Is this a pest? I don't know, it looks really creepy to me. All right, excellent, excellent. Okay, we got one more. Look at this, oh my gosh. Are we gonna squish this bug? 
Let's see some raise hands if we're going to squish this one. This one is really freaky, man. Totally. Okay. Yeah, right on. Okay. Well, guess what? Those are all good bugs. Those are all our friends. They all look really scary and weird. So let's meet them. So many of us know who this one is, right? You can uh, type the name out in the chat. This is our lady beetle or ladybird beetle, beetle or otherwise known as ladybug. Very popular, very you know common, I'd say probably the starlet of the good bug world. The lady beetles are going to come in a variety of colors and different spot patterns. Um, some are all black with just two red spots. Some are all black, period. Um, the ladybugs are predators of small soft-bodied insects, such as aphids, um, mealybugs, thrips, scale insects, white fly nymphs, and so forth. Both the adult and the larva are going to have very large appetites and absolutely adore eating aphids. The ladybugs throughout their lifespan can eat over 5,000 soft-bodied insects, which is amazing. However, something to keep in mind, if we don't have any you know, bad bugs in our garden, if we have already, if they've consumed all the aphids, for instance, they're gonna fly to another garden to where they can find a nice plant that's been infested with aphids so that they can consume more. They just want to eat aphids and other soft-bodied insects throughout their life. They will only lay eggs if they um, know that there's going to be enough food for their uh, young to feed off of. And uh, what we want to do to keep them around is to create a really nice habitat for them. We want to grow a diversity of plants such as trees, shrubs, and above all flowers. A variety of flowers is going to ensure that we have ladybugs in our gardens. We also want to include like a chunky mulch, uh, for instance, like a chunky arbor mulch. This is the type of mulch we get when we have like maybe a arborist come and chip those branches from their chipper. It's always going to be a little chunkier. This is going to be really nice to provide nesting places for the lady beetle, as well as um, having maybe um, branches, larger branches from some of our trees or larger shrubs, maybe line walkways or be perimeters around some perennial uh, beds. And the reason why is because these branches and this arbor mulch is going to create a really nice nesting area for the lady beetle, beetles to also uh, rest and hide out in. Um, all righty, so let's look at this one. All right, so a lot of us wanted to squish this friend. Does anyone know who this friend is? You can type it in the chat. Yes, it is the ladybug larva, the teenager of the lady beetle. Um, and they always look like tiny little alligators. Every spring when I'm working at a store at one of our local garden centers, it is inevitable that someone comes in with a little baggie filled with these going, oh my gosh, these are all over my garden eating my plants. I need something to kill it. When I have to break the news to them that actually these little tiny alligators are ladybug larvas eating the bugs that are eating the plants. So these little guys are going to be in a variety of colors similar to the adults where they can be all black or they will be, um, you know, show these brightly colored splotches or bands of bright orange or red and even gray on black. And they are going to feed for a couple of weeks before they pupate into the adult. And during that time, they could eat upwards of 400 soft bodied insects, including aphids. And um, they also are going to consume uh, the uh, scale insects, spider mites, and other insect eggs. So very, very helpful and um, hopefully very abundant in our gardens. Now look at this strange looking creature. This is the ladybug pupa. So after the larval form, it is going to uh, merge into this dome shaped little thing 
that doesn't quite look like a lady beetle yet, but you are going to see him or this uh, around the gardens. And they typically are attached to leaves and they're going to be in this pupil stage for about six to 15 days. So I just like to introduce you to this because we do see these in our gardens and it's something to be aware of that this is actually going to emerge as a lady beetle in just a number of days. And then these are going to be the eggs. So these are also very common that we see in the garden and not to be mistaken for any other pest insect eggs, such as the cabbage moth eggs. These are the lady beetle eggs. They are this golden yellow. They look like little footballs up on their point. And you will see them in clusters anywhere from like five to 30. I typically see them in smaller clusters. However, um, you know, we can also see them in larger clusters. And we'll start, the females are gonna start laying these eggs in the spring when we get those nice warm spring temperatures. And female lady beetles can lay up to a thousand ladybug eggs throughout that season. Kind of cool. All right. Who is this? Many of us will recognize that this is our green lacewing. We'll see the green lacewing fluttering around the porch lights at night. That's not uncommon. We also can see the green lacewing um, enjoying the pollen and nectar from many flowers in our garden. The green lacewing is also going to feed off of the honeydew secretions a lot of the soft-bodied insects create, such as the honeydew from the aphids or the scale insects, thrips, and so forth. Uh, this is um, strictly uh, a pollen and nectar and honeydew feeder. However, who is this? So many of us want to squish them. Do we know who this is? This is our lacewing larva. Now the lacewing larva is the predator, not the adult. This, this little tiny insect who is very small, three eighths of an inch in size and can grow as large as a half an inch. However, uh, when I, I've only seen them a few times in person and they're literally half the size of an aphid. So very, very tiny but they have very large appetites and they love consuming insects. They are going to feed on aphids, thrips, mites, mealybugs, white fly nymphs, small caterpillars, insect eggs, and other soft-bodied insects. Um, they have a nickname because they have such uh, ferocious appetites that they are nicknamed the aphid lion. Um, they can consume over 200 uh, insects during their very short two to three week larval stage. And uh, what I can share is when I was doing research for this program years ago, I believe it was the University of Purdue did a study and they found, check this out, that this little larva would go in, eat some aphids, hollow them out, keep the outer skin of the aphid, throw it on their back, as camouflage to come in to eat more aphids. Can you believe that? Remarkable. It just, it just, I gotta tell you, it just cracks me up. I just love it. They're so smart. Has anyone ever seen this? This is the lacewing eggs, totally weird. But if you have a plant that's completely infested with some aphids and it just looks really gross, take a closer look. These tiny, tiny, tiny little ovals that are white to light green in color are going to be on slender quarter inch stalks right above the leaf or the bud. And the reason why these eggs are on that little stalk is because when these eggs hatch and we get that ladybug larva, they are just so anxious to start eating. If all the eggs were on that plant of the part, the part of the plant, they would start eating their, the eggs of their siblings. So that's why mother nature has developed these to have be up suspended on this little tiny stalk. So have a closer look next time you're in the garden because check this out. This is the back of a leaf where we saw some ladybug larva feeding on aphids. So yes, these are all black ladybug larvae. 
And you'll see that one little lacewing egg, kind of cool. So I just wanted to share that they are out there. Flowers that we can uh, attract lacewings. Uh, lacewings love any flowers that are, excuse me, in the uh, carrot or sunflower family. So this is going to be plants like our dill, cilantro, and parsley. I let all of these go to flower because I know that my lace wings absolutely love the flowers from parsley, cilantro, and, um, and dill. But in addition to that, uh, asters, goldenrod, sunflowers, these are all going to be wonderful flowers that are going to attract our lace wings and keep them uh, breeding on site. Something else I can share is if you uh, feel that you don't have any um, lace wings or ladybugs at your property, then go ahead and before you go for that pesticide, uh, make a little uh, mixture of a tablespoon of sugar in a cup of water and spray your plants where you see aphid infestations. A lot of times the sugary substance is going to attract the lady beetles and the lacewing adults, which will then in turn have um, the uh, larva that they'll lay eggs and the larva will hatch to feed on the insects. All right, here's another favorite of mine. Does anyone recognize who this is? This is our surfed fly. Other, uh, another name it goes by is hoverfly. And the reason why is because we'll see this tiny little uh, yellow and black striped fly in our gardens buzzing around like a helicopter. They'll buzz to the left and hover, buzz to the right and hover. And this is not a bee or a wasp. Um, it does not have a stinger. It is not going to swarm. It's not going to hurt us. It wants nothing to do with us. It is a true fly that has adapted to disguise itself from birds and other uh, things that might prey on it. So uh, it is a true fly and it is a very important pollinator in our gardens. Okay, now remember we saw this weird looking little thing. This is actually the cervid fly larva. It is um, a little like caterpillar type because it's coming from a fly. It's actually a maggot, but we don't always like to use that term maggot. So I'll just use a little like worm like, um, you know, critter. Anyway, these are awesome. They are going to, we are going to see them in our gardens. Um, they specifically love to hang out on roses, but it's not limited to roses. This is going to be the only little worm-like caterpillar-ish type where it's going to range from like a limey green to a khaki brown. And the one thing it's always going to have is this light kind of creamy yellow to white racing stripe down its back. Kind of cool. So here's another picture. We see it. So at sundown, it's always fun to go in your garden and do a little beneficial insect hunting. It is not uncommon to find the surfed fly larva on your plants. Um, they're going to be pretty tiny. They're going to be anywhere from 1 32nd of an inch to a half an inch, depending on the developmental stage of the species. They specifically love aphids, but they're also going to prey on uh, scale insects, thrips and mites. That's why we'll see them a lot of times on roses. And um, I'll just share that they can eat hundreds of these insects during their little lifetime. So these are the surfed fly eggs. I just like to also introduce you to these because we're going to see these on the plants. They are always going to be laid individually. They're not going to be in clusters. The adults laying them one at a time. And they're typically going to be around aphid colonies or aphid infestations. We're going to see one, maybe two or three. Um, they are going to measure about one millimeter or one thirty-second of an inch. They're very tiny. And uh, 
their life cycle of the cervid fly is very short. It's really uh, two to four weeks tops. But how we can attract them to our gardens is um, they absolutely love sweet alyssum. I will dot sweet alyssum. I always get a couple six packs of sweet alyssum or I start it by seed, it grows so easily. And I will have sweet alyssum around my roses, around my perennials, around my lettuces and other uh, vegetable beds. Because when I've got alyssum and I don't need a lot, just a couple dotted about, that's going to be my insurance that I'm going to have surfed flies in my garden. Let me tell you, I sure do. I've got lots. Um, I can also share not just sweet alyssum, they love nepeta or catmint, yarrow, buckwheat flowers. Uh, again, when cilantro, parsley, and dill go to flower, they love that. And any other flowers that are going to be really tiny, they're going to just really adore that. So uh, keep that in mind. All right. Are you ready for this one? Remember this weird looking, creepy, weird thing? This is a mealy bug destroyer. It is in the, it's a lady beetle and that's the larva. Isn't that crazy? But the lady, the adult um, lady beetle, that is the mealy bug destroyer is very, very tiny. It is only about a sixth of an inch. Whereas the larva is going to be a little larger. Uh, almost a half an inch in length. In fact, twice the length of, or twice the size of a mealybug. And this is actually how we can identify when we have the mealybug destroyers uh, in a mealybug bug infestation. Because they look so similar to mealybugs, it's, they're often mistaken and you know, inadvertently killed with a pesticide, even an eco-friendly is going to um, you know, bring it to its death if we don't notice them. So when we have mealybugs present on a plant, and I know it's very alarming because mealybugs are pre pretty much the worst insect to have an infestation of because they're so challenging to get rid of. But look a little closer and see, do we have something that just looks like a supersized mealybug, something that's twice the size of an average mealybug? And if so, that is the mealybug destroyer. And let me share. These, both the, the mealybug uh, larva, destroyer larva and adult, are very uh, fast feeders. They move around very quickly. They're highly mobile and they are just actively seeking out mealybugs. If mealybugs aren't present, they're also going to go for scale insects and aphids and um, also uh, mites thrips, uh, white fly, uh, nymphs, and so forth, but they're, they're primarily just in, interested in the mealybugs. They can eat upwards of over 250 during their lifetime. Their lifespan is about two months, in which place uh, they will be, the adult will have laid over 400 eggs in that area. So you can have a nice little population of these mealybug destroyers really taking hold of that pest problem. All right, all right. Has anyone seen this? This is a tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm with some bling on it. I know this poor little tomato hornworm thinks it's all like bedazzled, but what it has are eggs from a parasitic wasp. So parasitic wasps are really cool. Parasitic wasps uh, are wasps that live part of their lives as a parasite inside other insects. There are several hundred species of parasitic wasps around. Oftentimes we don't even notice them because they're so tiny. You know, they're as small as maybe like a fungus gnat or a very, very small uh, fly. Um, typically we don't notice them. Um, and the re main reason is that um, they don't bite, they don't, uh, they don't sting, they won't swarm us. They won't bother us or anything else. All they want to do is lay their eggs on other insect pests to reduce those populations. That's their main focus. It's kind of cool. And they are uh, tremendous at controlling aphids, scale insects, leaf hoppers and leaf miners, uh, caterpillars, cockroaches, flies, beetles, white flies, and even ticks. So check this out. This picture on the right is uh, a branch of a camellia. 
leaves that a customer brought in. I was working in a store one day a few years back and me and the store manager got so excited because we knew exactly what it was. And so we must have looked really crazy because the person that came in was kind of freaked out. They're like, I got this on my plant. I don't know if it's a disease. I don't know if it's a weird growth. I don't know if this is a pest. And um, the associate and I, the manager and I were just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. We, I was like, I gotta take a picture. And then when we finally were able to calm down, we were able to explain, these were aphids. You had a very healthy garden because you were able to invite all these beneficial parasitic wasps in that laid their eggs on the back of the aphids. When the eggs hatch, they burrow into the aphids, enjoying their meal. And then they emerge out of these perfect circular holes that they create as an adult. Meanwhile, leaving these puffed, empty little uh, shells of an aphid, which are called aphid mummies. So the next time you uh, are, see a little aphid infestation, something else to look for are aphid mummies. Typically you don't see this many. Uh, I've seen them where it's just a few, uh, you know, uh, kind of scattered between aphids, but man, it is really cool to see mother nature doing its thing. All right. This might be one of the first friends to emerge. This is our soldier beetle. Soldier beetles are pretty cool and sadly get mistaken as pests all the time. The soldier beetles are going to be about a half an inch in length. They are in the same family as the fireflies. However, they do not have those light producing organs like the fireflies do. And um, they are really going to be uh, in this color pattern and maybe sometimes a little darker where it's almost all brown with the black wings. They enjoy flower nectar, flower pollen, um, as well as eating soft bodied insects. So they're kind of doing all of it. They're eating the flower pollen, the nectar and the bugs. They love aphids, small caterpillars, um, and any other little soft-bodied insect um, that we'll see cruising around our plants. They're going to be cruising around too. But they do absolutely no harm to the plants. So when we see them, understand that they're actually one of the first to emerge in the spring, very early spring, uh, out there hunting that first population of aphids. <clears throat> The females will lay the eggs in the soil. Those eggs are going to hatch. That larva that looks also like a very small alligator is going to hang out in the soil. Rarely do we ever see the larva, but that larval form of the soldier beetle is feeding off of a lot of ground dwelling insects, whereas the adult is feeding off of the plant feeding insects. So very helpful for us, really great. Um, so I just wanted to introduce you to um, our friend, the soldier beetle. And then of course, dragonflies. I feel like a lot of times we forget about the importance of dragonflies being in this area. We have a lot of water around us. So dragonflies are going to be very abundant. Dragonflies start by laying a lot, several, 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 several tiny little eggs the size of a maybe a dot you can make with a ballpoint pen, but uh, uh, they're going to scatter their eggs over uh, waterways or tucked on veg vegetation that's floating on water or even tucked in like um, muddy stream beds. And then after a few weeks, these eggs hatch, the larva is going to hang out in the waterways before they emerge as the adult dragonfly. During this time, the adult dragonfly is going to feast off of little flying insects such as mosquitoes, gnats, flies, um, and other little flying insects. They will, their feeding range is going to be about three miles from where they live, and they can consume over 500 flying insects during their life. It's really important the dragonflies, because they spend the first half of their life in the water, uh, they're very sensitive to pesticides. So it's really important to reduce the pesticide usage we use because many of the uh, chemical or synthetic pesticides 
uh, impair our waterways. They impair the water quality, which then uh, compromises the dragonflies. Um, I can also share that many of us use products like mosquito dunks and mosquito bits, which is a beneficial bacteria to, um, that is a larvicide that kills the, um, the mosquito larva feed off of it, and that's how it dies. This has no adverse effect on the dragonfly larva. Those products are very narrow uh, spectrum, only going to affect mosquitoes. So you don't have to worry about using those products and harming our dragonflies. All right, for those of you that are really freaked out by spiders, I'm sorry. I tried to pick some really nice pictures. I'm a huge fan of crab spiders. So those are three pictures of crab spiders in my garden. And then another little cutie one I found online. I just want to share that many of our common garden spiders are not web weavers. They're actually going to be hanging out at the base of flowers or at the base of the plants, uh, cruising around the ground or vegetation on the hunt for insects. They are, um, spiders are predators. They are looking for insects, other spiders, and other related anthropods. They are going to eat a lot of insects. In fact, when they're hanging out on the flowers, they're waiting for a pest to come, another insect to come and land, so they can pounce on that insect and devour it. Many of them are so small, they go unnoticed. So that's just something I'd like to share. Spiders um, really want to avoid people. They're uh, more afraid of you than you are of them. Most of them are harmless to humans. So I just like to have a little bit of tolerance for them. And something else I can share is that spiders are the most important, most beneficial insect on this planet. We have spiders on every continent of the globe and spiders eat more insects than any other beneficial, okay? So if we could gather up all the insects that spiders enjoy in a year, it equals the weight of 50 million people. Isn't that crazy? That's a lot. So. Uh, spiders are very important. So hopefully for those of you that are kind of freaked out by them, this will ease that stress a little bit. All right. So what the heck is this? Is this weird? These are beneficial nematodes. Beneficial nematodes are microscopic worm-like organisms that naturally live in the soil, feeding off of soil dwelling insects, such as fungus gnat larva, um, lawn grubs, uh, cucumber beetle or diabrotica beetle larva, um, cutworms, thrip pupae, uh, leaf miner, vegetable leaf miner larva, and flea larva, excessive ant colonies, root maggots, the list goes on. It's kind of cool. This is actually a picture of uh, nematodes attacking a fungus gnat larva. This is really great. So a lot of times if we have these pests, a lot of times the beetles uh, that are pests in our garden that maybe be munching on our roses and things like that. If we know that that beetle, that larval stage is going to be in the soil at some point in its life, during its life cycle, it is excellent to inoculate the soils with beneficial nematodes. The nematodes come um, in the retail market. We typically will see three species. We want to make sure we're getting the right species that is going to enjoy the pests that we have. They typically will feed off of a very large range of pests, so it's not um, that narrow. But uh, just make sure you're getting the right one for what you want. And then of course we have our native pollinators, our European honeybees and other pollinators that we wanna be on the search for. They don't always look so obvious. Like we, many of us recognize bumblebees, the carpenter bees and their honeybees, but a lot of us don't always recognize our other native bees because they're so tiny or they're different colors, but just check them out. We also wanna invite our beneficial insects and so what I'd like to do is pause and ask you, have a look at this picture. What do these flowers have in common? 
A lot of us might say, well, they're brightly colored, although we have some white cosmos on the bottom. But white can be a bright color if, you know, in the landscape, a lot of times we don't recognize it. The main thing that these flowers have in common is that though each flower might look like a single flower, the petals around each flower are the rays. And what's in the center, the button in the middle, is going to be hundreds of tiny little flowers. So be it the Gallardia, the Origeron, the Cosmos, even the Yarrow and the Alyssum, it's, it's a group of tiny little flowers that have petals surrounding a little cone or button of many tiny flowers. And why this is so important is because they attract beneficial insects because many of our beneficial insects are tiny. So what we want to do is we want to plant a variety of flowers that look like daisies or sunflowers, or we want to grow a variety of flowers that grow in clusters of tiny flowers such as a alyssum or yarrow. So this is very important. And remember, uh, letting a lot of our herbs go to flower or cooking herbs go to flower is a great way to attract beneficial insects. Some more resources that have amazing plant lists for our beneficials is going to be, of course, the UC um, Marin Master Gardeners, Our Water, Our World. Please have a look. We have this awesome handout, the fact sheet called Healthy Gardens that has a list of plants that will um, support uh, beneficial insects, as well as this brochure, The 10 Most Wanted Good Bugs in Our Garden. This is a really cool brochure to check out if you haven't already uh, become familiar with it, um, as well as referencing the plant list. Of course, the Marin Municipal Water District, our California Native Plant Society, the uh, Sonoma Marin Water Saving Partnership, and really any of your local Master Gardener chapters for those of you that are joining us from another location or your local state extension offices are going to have wonderful lists for pollinators and beneficials. Um, so for those of you that access the activity, the handouts that I shared, those four handouts came from this Pest or Pal activity guide that can be found at the Our Water, Our World website. So check it out if you'd like to uh, look at more of the pages. So beyond beneficial insects, we've got some other beneficial friends in the garden. This is a small garden frog. I always seem to have these little guys in my uh, string bean tower. So my you know, crazy uh, network of string beans, I always find these little frogs. And the reason why is because they love to eat aphids, fruit flies, mosquitoes, springtails, flies, moths, slugs, and snails and worms. So this little buddy is doing an amazing job and it's always so fun to see him in my um, string beans and other areas of the garden. And then of course our western fence lizards. Fest western fence lizards um, are insectivores. They're just out there eating insects completely, such as spiders, beetles, mosquitoes, um, and other little beetles and such. The females are going to lay uh, different clutches of eggs, about one to three per season, and each clutch of eggs might be three to 17. Those eggs are going to uh, be laid between April and July, and then they're going to hatch in August. So a lot of times we really see the populations of these lizards in August, which is wonderful. And uh, the cool thing about the Western fence lizard that I'm um, not sure if you know, a Berkeley, um, over at UC Berkeley, some Berkeley scientists found that ticks that feed on the blood of these lizards um, are purged of Lyme's disease. So it's really uh, strange. There's a yet to be identified little protein in, that the lizards have that neutralizes the uh, microbes that would then produce Lyme disease in the ticks. Totally crazy, right? So that's something, this is why on the West Coast, we have um, very few cases of Lyme disease because we can thank the Western les um, fence lizards. I'd also like to share that when we invite the birds, it's very important. 90% of the birds are feeding off of insects at some point of their life, typically when they're feeding their young. Birds around the world 
can eat up to 500 metric tons, metric, 500 metric tons of insects, such as beetles, flies, ants, moths, aphids, grasshoppers, crickets, and other anthropods. Birds are amazing at uh, keeping the populations of plant e eating insects at a very low numbers. So let's continue to invite the birds. And let me share it. We do not need to put the bird feeders out. Uh, the birds are going to come and take care of those pests for us as long as we're not using pesticides. And then of course the bats. Bats are really fun. Sometimes in our tighter urban areas, we don't really notice the bats, but here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have about 16 native species of bats, which is kind of cool. And in Marin, we have 13 known species of bats. Bats are a really important part of our ecosystem. They're out uh, feasting on mosquitoes and gnats and moths and other small insects at night. So I just like to uh, just remind you that our bats are out there doing some good work for us in our gardens as well. So how can we set our gardens up for success? We want to create a habitat by growing biodiversity. We're going to always plant uh, the widest variety of flowering trees, sh shrubs, and flowering plants whenever possible, ideally perennials. We're going to offer a water source. Now, a water source does not have to be big. I, lit I like to use a small glazed saucer that I have pebbles in, and I just fill the water up every day just halfway up those pebbles. And the reason why I have pebbles there is so that these small insects can use the pebbles as a landing pad to drink the water and not drown. We wanna let some flowers go to seed. And the reason why, so we have our bank of perennials and we know that the flowering season is coming to an end. Well, I like to stop deadheading them. I like them to go to seed and finish out their life cycle on a natural way. And the reason why is that the seed pods are going to be very beneficial to many of our birds. And then, as I mentioned before, when we use a chunky arbor mulch, this is going to provide nesting areas and shelter for many of our beneficial insects. We're going to leave a section of our garden raw or uncultivated natural for many of our ground nesting bees. And then we of course want to reduce using pesticides. Now, pesticides, which are the chemical controls, we're always gonna use as a last resort. We want to know our pest and only target that pest. We want to spot, apply the pesticide, avoid spraying the entire garden. Cause I can assure you the pests that are on that plant are not going to go to other plants or different species in the garden. Most of the insects are very plant specific. We always wanna use less toxic and eco-friendly products. However, the beneficial insects are not going to be exempt from this. They're also gonna be harmed if present. So the best way to apply these products is always at the end of the day at sundown when our pollinators are back in their hives, they're not going to be as active. And we really wanna make sure that those beneficials are not present. Once the eco-friendly products are dried on that plant, pollinators, beneficial insects can re-enter the area and these eco-friendlies do not have residuals that will harm them. That's what's making them eco-friendly. So that is why we want to be very clear that we um, know what the pest looks like and we're spraying. If we have to apply a pesticide, it's an eco-friendly and it's applied at the end of the day. We want to avoid applying a pesticide when the trees are in bloom. This is a big deal for fruit trees. When the fruit trees are in bloom, this is oftentimes when we have some pests like aphids, but the pollinators are also out there foraging. So we want to avoid that. And then we always wanna understand the unintended consequences of our actions. We especially wanna look out for products containing these common neonicotinoids. That's a tongue twister. Uh, these are going to be, be some of the common active ingredients that are seen on labels that are neonics. These products come as a liquid that we mix with water and use, apply as a soil drench or powders that we might sprinkle on top of the soil that we then water in, 
or ready to use sprays that we spray on the plants. All of these products work in a similar fashion where they are absorbed into the cell structure of the plant and then kill any insects that feed off of it. Now, here's the thing, our beneficial insects are going to eat insects that have fed off that plant. They're going to be affected by this pesticide. Something else I can share is that uh, the pollinators are going to come and feed off of the pollen, which is also containing these uh, pesticides. So please avoid using these products. UCIPM has this amazing resource that is a uh, pesticide rating for our pollinators and beneficial insects. It's the B precautious pesticide rating that's found at UCIPM. Check this out, it's really helpful. And then what I'd like to share is that proper identification of the pests is key. We want to always identify the pest. If we can't identify it, then we're not gonna be able to solve that problem. We wanna understand the life cycle of that pest because sometimes they're very short lived and we don't have to take any action, nor are they maybe even causing any relevant harm to our plants. We want to understand the habitat and timing of that pest because that's gonna help us manage it. And then we also wanna know who our natural enemies are, our beneficial insects, are they present? So here's another little game we're going to finish up with. So here are some lookalikes. And I apologize, some of the pictures are a little blurry because these are actually very tiny insects and these are a little bit uh, larger photos. But here's our mealybug destroyer that looks very similar to a flea beetle. Now, a lot of times flea beetles are all black, but a lot of times the ladybugs are all black too. And they're very, very, very tiny. So they're very similar in size. So here is a case where we could mistaken one for another. And then of course we have our cucumber beetles, which is a huge pest, but it could be mistaken for the mealy um, I'm sorry, mildew eating lady beetle. So the mildew eating lady beetle actually does look very similar to the cucumber beetle. It is, this isn't a very good picture, but they're kind of almost an olivey green to tan kind of khaki. And so this is just another case that we could be mistaken. And the cucumber beetle is not a green ladybug. It is actually a pest that is pretty, um, pretty much a problem in my garden. And then of course we have the damsel bug, which preys on a wide variety of small insects, but looks very similar to the leaf-footed bug that is a pest for tomatoes and pomegranates. So do you see how easy it is to get mixed up out there? So easy to accidentally uh, mistake a good bug for a bad bug. But here we are, we've got some great online resources for you. Not only do we have the Our Water, Our World website that has that catalog of fact sheets that I've talked about before that address specific pest problems and management that's going to be less toxic and eco-friendly for sustainable results, but we also have the UCIPM website that's going to go through the pest problems that of um, the plants we're growing as well as this great catalog of uh, beneficial predators and pollinators that we'll see. This is our um, quick tips for beneficial predators and ladybugs that we can check out. And there's also another really cool website I just would like to introduce you to if you're not familiar with, which is Bug Guide. You can check out Bug Guide. You can send photos if, of pests or insects in question or bugs in question, and they will help you properly identify it. It's kind of cool. And it's a lot of fun. The National Pesticide Information Center, not only do they have an amazing catalog of information on pesticides and how the active ingredients work and, um, and the consequences of those pesticides, those active ingredients, but there's also an amazing uh, quick list of natural enemies. They talk about who they are, how they look, and who they're eating. So check this out. It's another fun resource for you. 
as well as that UC Marin Master Gardeners, as I mentioned before, the plants for the pollinators is a really wonderful resource for you to reference. And in close, I'd like to share when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Uh, everything is connected. And I just want to share, this is a little surf and fly friend that landed on my thumb a couple years ago. And I was so happy because I just love them. I'm pretty sure that's my spirit insect. Uh, they're around me all the time, wherever I go. Anyway, with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We are going to finish with your questions. This is such a fun topic for me to talk about. And I hope that this has just inspired you to go out and do a little hunting in the garden, to look at our, uh, look for your friends, your garden allies, and to remember to maybe uh, stop and think before you go for that pesticide so that we can protect all of the um, beautiful habitat that we're growing in our gardens. Thanks so much. Suzanne, that was absolutely great. Um, we've got lots of questions and I'll just invite everyone uh, to look in the chat function. As we're going through questions, feel free to put your own if you haven't already. I've started grouping them into topics, which we'll start in just a second. But Tracy has also shared a link to our very short four question survey, um, an evaluation of today. And I please urge all of you to take a moment and just click on it and fill it out while we're going through questions, because that really helps all three of our nonprofit organizations continue this great work. Um, bringing safe and effective alternatives and resources to um, conventional and synthetic pesticides. So with that, Suzanne, thank you. That was fantastic. I, I learned something new every single time we, <laughs> we do these presentations. Um, so let me start at the top with um, just some general questions about attracting beneficials. Mm -hmm. We've got a whole group of questions. And the first is if you can recommend native California plants that attract lady beetles, great green lacewings, um, surfid flies, and or mealybug destroyers. Well, the mealybug destroyers are going to come when we have mealybugs. That's all you need. Uh, but as far as native plants, yeah, yarrow, uh, the buckwheat, uh, ceanothus, these are all really fantastic. The uh, native ridgeron. And uh, these are all going to be fantastic uh, plants to add to our gardens. Um, I even like to plant the Agastachys, the, um, I forget the native, the common name for that, but it's, um, this is another native, but it's going to also have slightly larger flowers uh, that'll also benefit our pollinators, I'm sorry, our hummingbirds and our butterflies, as well as a lot of our um, smaller pollinators. Great. Um, and where online, and I think you mentioned this, but where can we find pictures or images of all the beneficial insects? That's going to be at the UCIPM website. That's going to be a good place to go. And also the National Pesticide, wait, hold on. Oh my gosh, I always get it mixed up. Um, let me just go back a couple slides. Here, the National Pesticide Information Center. Great. This is also going to be a great resource for you. But there's so many more. I mean, this is those are just two that I'm mentioning. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and I know the Marin Master uh, Gardeners is also a great resource for when you've yeah. got a specific question. They've got a great um, helpline, but also email where you can snap a picture and send it. I've used that a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, and uh, about beneficials, are elder, box elder bugs beneficial? They're um, not necessarily beneficial, but they're not always a pest. Sometimes they're just a nuisance. And that's funny. I was going to put them in a slide as, and some pests are just nuisance. So um, I know that they've been known to come into a structure, at which point you could just vacuum them up. However, I do know that they nibble on some plants. Um, the UC, there is more information on UC IPM about the box elder beetle. Um, so or the box elder bug. So just uh, reference that to learn more. Again, a lot of times pests are, pest insects are going to really like specific plants. And so unless they're doing damage to that specific plant, 
it's not a pest any longer. And then it could just simply be a nuisance. But I also know birds love feeding off of them. So my tolerance for them, I see them all around my garden, is that they're food for the birds and lizards. Yep. And, you know, I think that's a really important concept in Stop, Think, Protect and in integrated pest management, because, you know, deciding where that threshold level is, is it really a pest? Um, and I know we have a lot more dandelions in our yard uh, because we decided that's okay. We, we want to see all those beautiful um, pollinators visiting. Um, okay, specific question about beneficials and releasing nematodes. Is there, um, is there which kind of the three uh, nematodes would you suggest releasing in our gardens? Oh, you have to um, go to your local retailer who might sell beneficial nematodes and they come in packages and on the package, it'll tell you um, what they do. So either for the long grubs or the flea destroyer, they all have kind of catchy little names. Um, that That's the best way. Got it. Any advice on how to attract beneficial the beneficial wasp? Uh, you don't really need to try to attract them other than reducing pesticide usage. The beneficial insects, all of them are way more sensitive to pesticides than the pests are. The pests have um, developed ways to be slightly more resistant or resilient to the pesticides. That's why they're pests, or that's one reason. Um, so we definitely want to reduce the pesticide usage and we want to, um, you know, just have some tolerance that there's going to be some uh, insects out there that we see as pests and just know, you know, we have a balance going on. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. And um, would you recommend, there were a couple of questions about aphids. Um, and one is if you can maybe just clarify using water to remove them. And then another question about, do you recommend sugar spray to attract beneficials as opposed to a hard water spray to remove aphids? So you can blast the aphids off with water, yes. If you've got beneficial insects present, you'll also be blasting them off. So let's just take a little bit of a closer look to see if they're present. Um, and then if you feel that you don't have enough beneficial insects, such as the lady beetle or the lacewing larva, yes, start by doing a little, that combination of a tablespoon of sugar with a cup of water and spray it on the plants and that will attract them. Okay. But I will share, plant flowers and they will come. You, um, Cosmos and Alyssum are my go-tos. I'll grow them by seed or get them, pick them up at the local garden center. The, uh, uh, I'm sorry, sunflowers are also, I mean, whatever you like, make sure, you know, ha, ha, try to find flowers that are like lots of clusters of little things. And trust me, if you grow cilantro, we all know cilantro bolts so quickly. I kind of just have, you know, I just grow cilantro pretty much for the flowers. Not only does it make a great cutting flower, but it attracts a load. So that's another thing for the parasitic wasps. If someone wants to attract them, plant cilantro and parsley and let it go to flower. You'll see them flying and gathering all the nectar. Typically it's the um, hoverflies and the parasitic wasps that are kind of swarming the uh, cilantro flowers and the parsley flowers. It's really cool. That is great. And, you know, that reminds me um, a little out of sequence, but we had a question about bees. Are, are bees nesting in the ground attack us when we walk by? No, no, no. Um, the bees that are ground dwellers or uh, wood, they, um, bees are going to either be in um, uh, tunnels abandoned tunnels by beetles, things like that in the ground or in little cavities that are in wood, like a stump of a tree or a branch or in hives. Um, the, our native bees or the bees that are typically cavity dwellers uh, or ground dwellers, they, a lot of them don't have stingers. A lot of them um, really don't wanna bother us at all. And many of them are just so tiny, we wouldn't even really recognize them. So no, they're not gonna attack us. Okay, great. 
Um, and back to uh, supporting beneficials about the fence lizard. I know in our family, those are our favorites. I know. How, how can we provide ways of safe or hi of safe hiding places? Do they burrow? Are they always above ground? Well, that's a really great question. Um, they do find ways to hibernate during the cold uh, months. Um, I would say they'd probably find like a little bit of a wood pile or the pile of bricks that you might have, or maybe a cavity underneath the patio, or um, maybe even a cavity under a raised bed. Um, I think that they find spaces. I'm really uh, surprised that um, I feel like where I live now, my garden doesn't really have a lot of places that might be nice habitat for lizards, but yet they still are there. So um, I, again, I think it's I think it's really though, sometimes in more urban environments, we might not have them because we're more prone to be using pesticides or we're more prone to have these super groomed gardens that might not, um, uh, be so inviting to some of these other uh, beneficial critters. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, we've got a, a whole bunch of questions about ladybugs that we'll turn to next. And um, as I do, let me invite all of our guests to um, take a look in the chat function. Tracy has shared that link to our real quick four question survey. So we're glad so many of you are still with us. And if you wouldn't mind just quickly filling that out while we're doing this, that that's so helpful to us. Um, so about ladybugs, are there any downsides to ladybugs? I know that there are areas, I did live on the East Coast for a brief period of time where ladybugs were considered a pest because when the winter comes, the ladybugs come into the house. Mm -hmm. And um, in that case, it was, you know, people would just vacuum them up and then try to uh, seal off that cracker crevice, however, at that point of entry. Remember, we've talked about that before with IPM. But as far as I'm concerned here in, you know, the Bay Area and California, they're not a pest and I can't imagine that they would be. Great. I mean, I just don't see how, I mean, maybe there's a case, but I, I am not familiar with one. Great. Um, and is it better to use ladybug eggs so they'll stay rather than the ladybug itself? And there's a related question to that, which is what's your, your opinion on purchasing ladybugs? Okay, so um, as far as I know, we're not able to purchase the eggs. We just want to create a very inviting habitat. And if that ladybug, the adult lady beetle, feels that the habitat offers enough viable food for its young, it will then lay eggs and then those eggs will hatch and then the cycle will stay. Um, so to answer, I guess that question is, is just, you know, if, if your garden has enough food for the lady beetles, then they will stay put and thrive. As far as buying insects, I know it's really fun to buy insects, um, especially for the children. But I have found that um, really all you have to do is plant plants and they will come. I have lived in a lot of different um, places around the Bay Area, primarily San Francisco and then to Marin and just plant the flowers and they will come because the flowers attract, uh, always attract a small population of pests, which then is going to be food for our beneficials. Got it. Um, okay. And uh, let's see, what are the differences between male and female ladybug adults? Um, I'm not sure if it is, um, if I can, if you can identify that without getting a very up close and personal look. So um, I'm not sure. And, and both would be beneficial to eating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and okay, and then what what insects prey on uh, earwigs? And it's great we have somebody from Chicago that asked that question as well as somebody locally. Um, I think that's my friend from Chicago. Um, if that's Mark, hi Mark, so great to see you here. Uh, if it's earwigs, uh, typically it's going to be birds, chickens, 
um, lizards, frogs. What else can I think of? Snakes, you know, a little bit slightly larger. And I bet um, praying mantids would probably feed on the earwigs. Um, I don't typically talk about the praying mantids, as you notice, they weren't in my program because they um, also, they, they don't discriminate, they just eat anything. So I typically don't give them that much uh, attention, but it's always fun to see them in the garden. Yeah, yeah that, makes, that makes sense. Um, we've got another couple specific questions about, um, well, soil ants. Can you speak to soil ants? Are they beneficial or pest? Oh, I love that question. That's actually on um, one of my, um, that's actually a question I ask when I do uh, classes for a lot of the retailers. Uh, ants are beneficial. They are going to aerate the soil. They're indicators. Uh, if we have an, you know, a lot of times if they're around the foundation of our house, they're showing us that um, there could be termites because they feed off of the termites. They also, in some parts of the United States, they pollinate flowers. Um, they also eat other insects, um, not just the termites. However, they can be a nuisance, especially when they want to get into our flower pot to raise beds. But typically, if they're in our flower pot to raise beds or sections of the garden, that's also an indicator that that section of the garden might be too dry or doesn't have enough um, you know, like biology in it. So we want to maybe, in, um, you know, amend that soil, get some compost in there, maybe get some uh, worm castings, get some compost tea if we can, and um, make sure that we are maybe, let's grow a cover crop and get it a little bit more active. However, there are some areas that, you know, some people I know feel like they are literally on an ant hill. And if that's the case, there are beneficial nematodes that we can um, inoculate the soils with that will take care of excessive populations of ants. But it's not going to be all the different species. This is where you'll have to get um, a little bit more research. Now, on the resource page, the garden resource page, I did list uh, a business called Rincon Vitova. They're a local insectary, actually they're in Southern California. And for harder to manage pests, the, they are uh, an, a tremendous resource for biocontrols. What I would recommend is if you have a, a strange situation that you would like to employ some biocontrols, reach out to them and they will assist you with what would be the best thing. That's, that is great answers. And um, Tracy is sharing in the link and we'll follow up with an email after today with um, the resource pages we mentioned. And um, I just love this about integrated pest management and, and gardening with this mindset is it becomes, you know, part of a detective game too. It's like, hmm, what oh, yeah. that's mean about my, my soil and soil health. That's great. A um, couple other questions about specific um, pests. Is there a um, predator? Oh, sorry. I'm not sure if it's predator or predictor for cucumber beetles. Maybe predator. Well, so cucumber beetles, um, here's the thing with them. They are a huge pain. I really um, mad. I get <laughs> I get mad at them when I see them because I'm like, oh. So I'll walk around. Their defense mechanism is that they'll drop when they see you. So I walk around with a bowl of soapy water and they drop right down into it if they're too fast for me. Cause I've learned, even though I used to be grossed out by squishing them and now I just squish them because I'm just like, err. Uh, but then uh, right now, see we here in the Bay area, we had a very warm February. And so I already saw my first cucumber, adult cucumber beetle. And I was a little bit um, harrumped by it, but now we just got some cold weather again, but I would suspect we're going to get warm weather again. And then this is the time to inoculate the soils with the beneficial nematodes that feed off of the larva of the diabrotica because that larva is overwintering in the soil. So if we can apply the beneficial nematodes, they're going to eat the larval stage and reduce the population of the cucumber beetles. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and I just love that idea of using that something that's beneficial and, and putting it into the soil to help with um, pre preventing a problem instead yeah. of 
checking it after it, it gets there. Um, we do have a very specific question about, um, can you help with rose slugs? Mm -hmm. we so have the ro rose slugs, okay, so this is where we wanna be really clear and make sure it's a rose slug and not the um, uh, cervid fly larva, but rose slugs are typically always on the leaves. They're skeletonizers. So um, if, if I had the rose slug, I would want to be really, really careful. And then we can use products like BT, which is a beneficial bacteria that they'll ingest or a product that I love, um, which is Takedown by Monterey uh, Lawn and Garden, which is the pyrethrin and canola oil. By, remember, pyrethrins are botanical, comes from a chrysanthemum flower, not to be confused with a pyrethroid, which is highly toxic to our environment and our waterways, but pyrethroid. Um, or you can get another product by Monterey, which is... Um, just a straight pyrethroid. I know Safer Brand makes a couple like pyrethroid and soap. I think it's um, their yard and garden product. But anyway, um, it's a very effective way to kind of um, knock back that rose slug. But again, we want to not focus on the tips of the roses, really make sure we're only focusing on the leaves. But at that point, why don't we just smash them or like clip them off, put them in the green can. There's other things we can do, but um, yeah. And monitoring, because you know, at the first sign is when we really want to get in and kind of manage it without um, it getting out of control. Yep, and I'll also point um, folks who are interested in roses to a fantastic local resource, the Marin Rose Society, um, which has uh, a newly refreshed website that has tons of information. Because I know we, I planted roses this season and um, had all sorts of questions and found resources there as well. Um, let's see, I think I've covered all of the questions we received in the chat. Um, can you raise your hand or pop a question in if I missed one? Um, and we also have the link to the survey if you haven't had a chance to fill that out. We're really excited that we were able to bring you um, I do have a couple more questions, Suzanne. And I just want to thank you again, um, Suzanne, because you're such a fantastic presenter, obviously just a wealth of knowledge and experience. And um, we appreciate the collaboration. Thank um, you. A couple more questions. Um, snails on Meyer lemons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hand pick them off. Okay. Throw and them to the chickens and ducks. Yeah. It, it, what is the best time to find those snails? Uh, um, at night or in early in the morning before the sun's come up, especially after uh, heavy fog where there's a lot of moisture in the air or after a rain, they love cool, moist conditions and they do not like the sun. That's why they're going to be hiding. Which would explain why I don't see them when I need to. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the last question is, do you have tips for detracting deer? Uh, a deer fence. So working with barriers. So I know that's um, oftentimes, I can't tell you how many times so you're probably like, I can't put a deer fence up. Uh, it won't work or my garden, you know, there, it won't fit or aesthetically, I don't want it, but that's the only way. So when we're working with urban critters uh, like deer, we want to put up a deer fence that's uh, no shorter than seven feet. And I'll, I think I can speak to that experience too, because deer literally walk down our front, our street. Yep. <laughs> so uh, we have a deer fence, but what we had to do in our um, garden, I mentioned for a newbie gardener here, is we actually took PVC pipe and, um, you know, just chicken wire basically, or narrower than chicken wire. We just built little boxes for our garden yeah. bed because yeah. we lost a uh, yeah. crop to them and, and that has worked. Yeah, exclusion baskets. That's excellent. Yeah, and, and obviously it wasn't just deer. I think we also had some rodents, some raccoons. Yeah, lots of critters, but we, we kept them out. Um, that is great. I think we've covered all of our questions. We are so thrilled that you all joined us. Um, thank you for filling out our survey. We are going to um, send a follow-up with a video of this presentation and all the resources we mentioned. 
And please visit our three um, websites. We have lots of resources there for you as you continue on your journey to making our um, environment and our homes and, and gardens safer for all of us. And that is our waterourworld.org, rinmg.ucanr.edu, or just Google Rin Master Gardeners and yardsmartrin.org. Thank you all so much for joining us and we wish you a very happy weekend and spring season. Thank you everyone.